On Wikipedia, you may have noticed these convenient cards which appear when you hover over a link. So this is one style of card where the image and the text are stacked vertically, not horizontally. So the image is first, the text is last. There are other types of cards as well, such as this one, which is just text only, and this one, which is where the image and the text are displayed, are stacked horizontally, not vertically, so side by side. Another important feature is the positioning. So as you can see, the links hovered over on the left. The majority content, the majority width is facing towards the right. But if we go on the same type of card on the left, as you can see, it's facing, the majority width is facing towards the left. I have taken the liberty to recreate all of this myself and I'll be showing you how to recreate it in the contents of this tutorial. So we hover over fruit, again, it's the same card. The content is hovering over towards the right. When they hover over this one, again, same type of card, but it's hovering over towards the left. Same with this type of card, this arrow one. As you can see, the arrow, which is positioned in relation to where we're hovering over the links. As you can see, we hover over the link here and the arrow is towards the left of the link. But then when we hover over the link on the right, the arrow now appears and it's towards the, the right of the link. And again, same type of principle. The, heart, the arrow here, I know it's faint because the contrast is low, but the arrow is actually towards the right when before it was on the left. And all of this text, all of this is stored in a database. We've created this fade out text effect. And even though the text was stored in the SQL database here, we've found a way to actually make the text bold before you render it to the HTML document. And we've also done the fade out text effects even from data that was stored in a SQL database. So keep watching and find out how to make this. We start the tutorial in an empty project folder. The only thing that we set up beforehand is the images. So we've created a folder called images, which contains the images that we'll be using. These are directly downloaded from the Wikipedia website to the correct sizes. I'll explain more on that later when we get to it. To start, we'll open up a new terminal and we'll use it to open up our source code editor of our choice. I'm using VS Code in my case. And now once it's loaded up, we can create the HTML file called index. We can type an exclamation mark to create the boilerplate code. And for the title, we'll just call it Wikipedia Apple Dummy, because that's what it's a replica of. Below this, we'll need to set up the style sheet, which we'll create shortly. Its ref will be it's rel, sorry, will be style sheet and it will link to styles.css. In the body, the last element, so the script will only be loaded once all the other elements have been loaded up, or so we'll say it's script. It needs to be the last element, and so we'll create it like so in the body. And then it will just link to style, no, sorry, not style, scripts.js. And once we've done this, we can create the style sheet. So I'll say styles dots. Oh, wait, no, it's just style actually. Very important that we get that right. We don't get our names confused. First thing that we'll do is we'll select everything uh, because we want to remove the margin. We want to remove the browser's default margin and padding that sometimes gives elements. And we'll also need to set every element to use box sizing border box. From that, we'll set up the font family to be these fonts, this nice sans serif font collection. So if Arial is not available, then it'll use Helvetica and then sans serif will be the backup font. Once you set up the basic styling that, that you should be, that should be common practice for every style sheet, we can go back to our body and we can start doing the markup. Inside the body, we'll create a div, which will help with the width of our text. It will have a class. The class will be text center. Inside of that, we will create a new div. It will have the text. It will contain Apple, that'll be the title. I need to give it a class so we can give specific styling to the title. It'll be called header, as so. Below that will be horizontal wall. And then below this, we'll add the main paragraph. So inside the main paragraph, what we'll do, we'll just copy this. 
Um, we'll open up actually a notepad document just to move the default styling. This is what I normally do when I copy text on website just because it might come with a default styling that we want to move. And then from notepad we can just copy it into our into VS code. Now we can see what this looks like if we just go into index.html. Again, it needs to be styled, but it is in the correct font that we want to use, which is good. Actually, before I continue, if you notice on the Wikipedia website, some of the text is bold, so we need to configure that ourselves. So what we'll do, we'll say span. Span allows us to style specific text inside a paragraph element. We'll give it style, and then we'll say font. Set the font weight to be bold of Apple. The other set of text that's bold is this apple tree, this line which begins apple tree. Well, it's not a line, it's a short section. So we'll just enclose it at the end of the sentence as so. And again, we'll give it the same style, font weight bold. Check to see that looks good because sometimes it can be spacing problems. There doesn't seem to be any spacing problems here. So we can proceed, we'll go back to our styles. So the first thing that we'll style, apart from what we've already done, we'll say we'll style the text center class, which will contain our document text. We'll say the width will be 100%, but then we'll also say max width to be 1600 pixels. So on smaller screens that are smaller in width than 1600 pixels, then the width will be 100%, but in terms of large desktop screens, it won't be full width, it will only be 1600 pixels wide. And we'll center the text, we'll say margin, whoops, zero, vertical, horizontal will be auto, that will center it horizontally. Then we'll style the header inside the header class, only the header class inside the text center class. The font family of that will be a serif font, a serif font, so we'll choose the Georgia times the Roman, which guarantee which will be guaranteed to give a serif font, no matter what, because all this all these fonts are serifs. And we'll also get a margin top of 20 pixels. Below that we'll start with the horizontal wall which you created. We'll say margin, 2 pixels on the top, 0 pixels on the right, 10 pixels on the bottom, 0 pixels on the left. Then we'll set the border or the line solid grey, so now it'll be a solid grey line of 1 pixels, but we want it to be extra thin, so we'll actually remove the border top, so now it will be an even, an even thinner border of just half a pixel. And whilst we're at it, we'll also, whoops, we'll also just style, we'll say text center, we'll just style the paragraph inside the text center, and we'll just say line height. Space out the lines a bit so not too squished. 1.3 am. Now if you refresh, as you can see, it's looking good now. We'll also do, whilst we're at it, we will create our first links. So we'll say create a new comment. So we can separate things out, we'll say styling links, go back to our markup. We'll create a link over fruit, uh, so we'll create space to open it up. I need to have a href, just so it has the normal behaviour of a link. But it, does, it won't lead us anywhere. It won't redirect the user to any different route. And then it's important that we put the closing link tag, no spaces between the text and the closing link tag. This is because we don't want to link the space between the words, basically. We will also put a link between trees. We'll do this for now. There will be, we will add other links later on, but just for testing purposes, we'll add them in these two places. Again, I'll have the same href rule. Now, as you can see, this is not the behavior that we want really because it's underlined. It's, we only, in Wikipedia, they only underline it when you hover over it. So there's a change that needs to occur. We'll start the while with the changes, but that's the most obvious. So we'll create a new line. We'll use the pseudo class of link to style the link tag in its normal state. So we'll just say text decoration none. So we'll move to underline. Because you only want that to appear when the user hovers over it using the hover pseudo class, the colour will be a hex value of 
zero six four five AD. It's got a nice blue colour. Now we use the active, so when the user is clicking on the link, but before the redirect you it's been triggered. This will the colour of it will be a yellow colour which is used by Wikipedia. So FAA seven hundred. And the text decoration, this will be underlined, so we'll say so, text decoration, underline. And as I said before, we'll also need to use the hover pseudo class. And we'll just say that to you, we well, have the same colour, but we just want to add an underline as so. So now, it's not underlined, only when we hover over it's underlined. And also when we click, as you can see we're holding down the click. And it changes to this sort of orange colour, but then when we click off, it changes back to its blue colour. This is the behaviour that you want. Now it's time to create the card container markup. In our real application, it will be rendered in the JavaScript file, but we want to create the markup to see what it will look like first. So we'll create a new comment so we can separate things out. This is below the text center div because these card containers will be absolute position. So it will be completely irrespective of the HTML document flow. And we'll just say card container markup. Doesn't really matter as long as it gives the necessary message. Now there will be three basic card container types. The first one will be the one where the image and the text are parallel vertically. The image is first and then the text is below it. This will be, we'll give it a class of card container one, this will be the first type. Inside we'll have another div. Its class will be, we'll say card picture container. I'm using what's commonly termed kebab case to name these div classes. Inside will be an image element. At the moment we'll just say, we'll link to our tree image which VS Code helpfully gives us a snippet to and we'll give it an alt text of apple tree again later on when we actually get to doing setting up the database these containers will be rendered dynamically based on which link we're hovering over but at the moment we're just, we're just doing the design of the container so it doesn't matter whether we use placeholder data or not Below this, below the card picture container div, we'll create another div. And that will be, we'll say card picture text. Inside will be a paragraph. And what we'll do, we'll get the text from, yeah, we're doing the tree one. As you can see, this one here, we'll just copy this here. Copy this text. Whoops. Okay, it goes up to A to human. Again, this will all be sorted out later on. When we get on to limiting the number of characters in the SQL database. So it's up to there. Let's copy it into our notepad. Check to see the text looks good. It looks alright. So we'll copy it and we'll paste it into a paragraph. VS Code helpfully sorts out the styling for us. Now, again, as I mentioned before, this human, it's faded text. So what, how, the way that we're going to achieve this, on the last word we will do the span elements and encapsulate it so we'll put the closing tag there and then its class will be fade hyphen text now let's move on to the styling so below where we've done the styling we'll create a new comment and we'll say card containers and the first one will be the container that we just created which is card container one position, as I said before, will be absolute. We'll set the display to what well, the display will be flex. And then the flex direction will be column because, as I said before, the image and the text are parallel to each other vertically, not horizontally. And the width of the container will be a set width of 320 pixels, and the height again will be a set height of 420 pixels background color we'll set that to white okay and below that we will do the we'll start the card container picture inside the card container one it's very important that we use the hierarchical selector which is what these spaced selectors are called 
It's because we'll, we'll be reusing these same class names inside the other types of card containers. And we don't want to overwrite the styling. Its width will be 100% and its height will be 232 pixels. Then we will do the image inside the card container picture. So again, we'll use card picture container and then we'll do the greater than sign and then we will specify the image element. We'll just set the width. We want it to match its container. So because of this, we want the images that we use need to roughly match the dimensions of this card picture container. They don't have to match 100%, but if they stray too far away from the dimensions, then it will be too stretched because we use the percentage values. Below that, we will again card container one, and then we will say card picture text this time, which is the container member. So we'll say card picture text. Its width will be 100%. And because we use flex, that will just be the rest of the room that isn't already taken up by the picture inside the card container. Its background color will be white, and to get that shadow effect to make it stand out from the rest of the page, we use the all-important box shadow. Offset X will be zero, offset Y will be zero, blur will be 50 pixels, spread we're going to pull it back in a bit with minus 30 pixels, and we'll give it a color black. Now, the final thing inside the card container one, we'll say card container one, and then card picture text, and then we'll start the paragraph inside the card picture text. It's text align, we'll align it to the center. Font size be 0.9 EM, and we'll say padding. 10 pixels on the top, 20 pixels on the right, zero on the bottom, 20 pixels on the left. Now, actually wait, if we refresh now, as you can see, here is the element here, but the reason why it's positioned weirdly is because we use absolute positioning. So what we'll say, we'll just say, again, this will, this will be moved later on, but for now we'll say left 200 pixels, something like that, doesn't really matter. So now we can see it more and we'll just say bottom. 800 pixels, so it's more close to the bottom. Okay, that's a bit too far, actually. We'll say 300. Yeah, that looks fine. Gives us a rough idea what they look like. Okay, now we need to do the markup for the second card container. So below the card container one, very important that's not nested inside. Actually, we'll create a comment just to separate things out so it's extremely clear. Card container one end, we'll say. So we know, so there's no chance of us nesting different containers inside of each other because that'll be a disaster. The class will be card container, just two instead of one this time to keep things uniform. Again, as I just hinted at, it won't be too dissimilar, so it will also have a div. In fact, just to speed things up a bit, we have that same card picture container div which will contain the image. All we'll do is we'll change the image from tree to strawberry, which again we already saved before this toy even began. And because of that, we'll change the alt text as well. So it's relevant to help people up with screen readers. And below that div, again, we will simply copy this out actually, but we'll change the text so it's the strawberry text instead. So we'll go back to Wikipedia, see what the text is. Now this one doesn't have the faded text because there's not a lot of text to display in the card to begin with. But we will just copy that out so it begins with in and then flower formed. No flowering was the ending text. So paste that in there to remove any inconsistencies that you might have with the text styling. And then we'll just paste that in there. As I said before, no need for the fade out span text, which I haven't even created yet at the moment. But it will later on, and whilst we're at it, actually, we will, we will create the final card container. So we'll say card So this card second container is for these horizontal ones where the text and the image are displayed side by side. The last type is the just these simple ones, just so no images, just text on their own. So we'll create, we'll create the div. Give it a class of card container, but three this time because it's the third type. 
and then inside I have the paragraph element and we'll just copy this, this genus and we'll copy it up to binomial paste it into notepad we will also delete that it's actually up to here and we'll need to style it so below the card container 1 we'll create the card container 2 class inside its width will be 450 pixels this time and its height or 251 pixels position again we want to take it out of the HTML document flow so it will be absolute display will be flex so write it in like that box shadow will be not not so no offset and that'll be 50 pixels blur or we'll bring it back in by 30 pixels and be black actually actually it's the same box shadow as earlier should have noticed that really but background color will be white its top will be 20 pixels its left will say 400 pixels this time bottom 300 pixels again so we change later on we just doing it now so we can see what it looks like border radius this one will be a bit rounded off and we'll give it two pixels round off the edges of it overflow so the image doesn't overwrite the, the border radius will be hidden below that we'll do the card picture container so just to speed things up we'll copy it here and just change the numbering to two and this time we'll say min width so it can't go, it's literally impossible for it to go any wider than this, we'll say 215 pixels and its height will be 100% and then the image inside so again copy, change the number actually it's going to be completely the same so the width and height will both be 100% and the text will be as well the only styling this will have is width 100%, height 100% so it takes up the rest of the width inside the card container that hasn't already been taken up by the image it does this because the card container is display flex and then as for the paragraph again we'll copy it one more time I know it's tedious but it's necessary to make a good design and this will simply be 10 pixels vertical and the same length horizontal so on the left and right final card container is the third one so we'll do that now card container 3 this white this width will be 320 pixels and its height will be 203 pixels by the way if you're wondering where these dimensions are from these are the dimensions they're the exact dimensions that Wikipedia uses for their cards and I noticed that it's the same width and height for each time, which is the reason why we're not using dynamic sizing. Simply because Wikipedia doesn't use it, and this is a Wikipedia replication after all. Box shadow will be the same as before. And this left will be 600 this time, so we're incrementing by 200 each time. And bottom, again, same 300 pixels, just so we can see it. And we'll give it a background colour of white just so the box shadow has something to work off and then we will style the paragraph inside the card container so card container 3 greater than sign so the direct child of the card container font size will be 0.9 em text align will be the center and then padding we will say 10 pixels top 20 pixels right not pixels bottom, 20 pixels left and now finally what you've been waiting for the fade text effect which is given to the last element of cards where there's a lot of text so we'll create it now, so we'll say fade text background will be it's important that it's background and not, not background colour because this is technically an image, background image the linear gradient method open up the direction will be to right comma starting color is black the middle color 
because there'll be three values in total and they're all at equal proportion unless you specify otherwise. Or will be black as specified by three noughts in RGB and that'll be 0.3 opacity. And then the final colour, so this will be at two thirds of the way, will be black but it will just be nothing, so no opacity, it's completely invisible. And what we'll do then, we'll say background clip will be the text. So what this will do, this will only show the background on pixels where the background and the text overlap. And then we'll set the text color to be transparent. So what this will do is basically, it will create, the text will essentially act as a mask for the background and because the text color itself is set to transparent, the text color will be changed to the background color essentially. And because the background color is a linear gradient, which fades out to transparent, we get this effect where, if we refresh, whoops, okay, that's not good. Okay, so clearly the values need to be, they need to be spaced out a bit further, so we'll set the width of, so we'll set the left value of card container two, you know, we'll set that to 800. And then as for card container three, we'll just say, instead of left, we'll say right, and we'll set that to be 300 pixels. So now we should be able to see them all without any overlap. So as you can see, this first one here, the hum because this is the only one that we applied the span to, as you can see, it's got this fade out effect. As for the other ones, yes, they're looking good. Sometimes card type 2 will be, the image will be on the right instead of the, instead of the left, but very simple to do that because it's display flex. All I need to do is change the order of the picture and the text. So the text will be first instead of the order. Very simple to do. The, the only thing left to do in terms of styling would be to create the animations of the card coming in and the card going down. It animates up and then comes down. So as you can see, yeah, see so it animates in there and then we hover off and then it sort of displays a short animation. It's not too exuberant, but it is present. So what I need to do is we'll create the new comment and it will be called card container animation. Well, that's what the comment will be anyway, just to, so we know what we're doing and there's no confusion. Keyframes, keyword to create an animation and then it will be called card container in. So this is clearly for the appearing animation. The beginning property will be transform translate x on the y, so vertically, and then it'll be moved 10 pixels downwards. And its opacity will be zero. So completely invisible to start with. And then at 100%, so the finishing keyframe, it will be translate y zero. So like pixels, oh wait, we don't need pixels, were they? And then opacity will be one, so it will now be fully visible. And because we've done the coming in animation, we need to do the going out animation as well. So that will be card container out, open up, 0%, we'll say transform, translate Y, start at zero this time, because it needs to go, it needs to be moved, animated back down. And then opacity will be one. So it starts off fully visible because all this animation is, is just a verse. So we'll just copy the starting values of the going in animation for it, for that finish of the going out and out, going out animation. And we need to apply this animation to all of our card container classes. So we'll go up to the third one to begin with and we will say animation card container in 0.3 seconds forward and then we'll just apply the same property and its value to the other ones as follows and if we go back to document if we refresh we can see it coming in we won't be able to see the going out animation just yet but this looks good a nice snappy animation that's not too overt and distracting one thing that I still need to do actually is on this first card container type. If you go on the Wikipedia, you can see that they've actually got this arrow. So I know that's, that's the second type. See on this third one here, they've got this arrow. The way that we're going to create it is we're going to use what's called a clip path, which acts as a mask. 
So below this property here, above the animation, it doesn't actually matter, but we'll just create it. Clip path. So it's hyphen, not underscore. Clip path. And the shape will be polygon method. The first point, because we got a box shadow, we want it to be to the left by 10% more than it needs to. So it will show that box shadow, which is added to the card picture text here. And it will start at 3% downwards. This will give room for the arrow to work off. And then we'll go to the 10% mark. And again, it will be the same way downwards in terms of vertically. So it will just be to create a straight line because obviously if it's a different vertical value, then it won't be a straight line. The third point will be 15%, 0%. So this is the arrow tip. And then we'll create the right tip of the arrow. This one's level with the previous, with the first two points of 3%. So now that arrow is finished, we can go to the top right point and that will be 110%. Again, not 100% because we want to show the box shadow. And it will be 3% to make it level. And now we'll create the bottom right point, which is 110%. Again, 110% because it's the bottom right, so it's fully extended out. And then the final point will be the bottom left. And that will be 5%. Again, a bit downwards because we want the box shadow to be seen. And then 110 percent will be its vertical percentage and now if we see what this looks like if we go back to our document we refresh as you can see it's created this arrow here and it's cropped off three percent of the top of the image just so it could create this arrow this is what we want it's good and what we need to do now we'll need to fortunately because we've done what we need to do here we will delete all of these we will still leave the card container markup just as a reference for JavaScript but we'll comment it out. In VS Code the way that we comment it out is by control and then forward slash but you can just add it, it's not hard to add that error like that and now all this will be disappeared but we still got a reference to it here. Now it's time to create the back end of our project. So to create the back end we'll need to go back to our root project folder and then what we'll do is we will start open up a terminal. I've actually already got one open up in my project directory. And then we we'll need to open up a terminal. I've actually already got one opened up in my project folder. So what we'll say is in the terminal, we'll say no package manager in it, short for initialize. And then we we'll use the Y flag just to speed things up. It automatically says yes for everything. From there, we can simply go back and we'll create a file called server.js. What we we'll need to do now actually is we will create a folder, we'll call it public, and this will host all of our static files. We'll move the HTML in there. We'll move the styles as well. And we'll just close it like that. In the terminal, what we'll need to do is we'll need to install Express and my SQL because we'll be using a SQL database for this tutorial. So you do that using npm i express SQL or separated with a space. Install those two dependencies. Once they're installed, we can do. Oh yeah, we we'll also need to move the images folder into public as well because they'll be served up statically. And then now we can require Express, so we can const Express equals require express and then we can also require mysql as follows const mysql equals require mysql and then below that we can create the mysql connection so we'll say connection so we know what we're doing it'll be assigned to an object called db and then we'll say mysql dot create connection taking an object specify the parameters Host by default, unless specified otherwise, be 127.0.0.1. And also by default, user will simply be root. It won't be assigned a password unless you've assigned one yourself. And if you've done that, you'll know what it is. So you'll need to add that password field in if you have. I personally haven't. And for error detection, we'll say db.connect. This takes in a callback function with an argument of error if there is one. So if there's an error, then we will throw that error, which will stop the application. Else we will console.log 
my SQL connected. So we know that we've successfully successfully connected to SQL. Below that, we'll need to initialize the app. So we'll say const app equals express because we're using express as the backend framework. And we'll need to set up the app to handle JSON requests, post requests. So we'll say express.json app.use method and we'll also say app.use express.url encoded and then we'll set extended to be true. Again, this is just for the HTTP request handles. Below that, we need to set up the app to listen to port 3000. So we'll say app whoops dot listen 3000 and also process we we'll use two pipes to specify or process.env.port in our capitals this is simply if you're hosting the local server on a remote server if you are hosting the application on a remote server and then what we'll log server has started on port 3000 in a callback function. So we'll see this message if the app is successfully listening to port 3000. Now we'll create a comment below where we initialize the app. We'll say load up page on default root and we'll say app.get. It will be the default endpoint, which is just a forward slash, nothing after that. Callback function takes in request and response. And we'll just say res.send file. And then it'll be der name plus der name so the local server knows where the root directory is. Slash public to access the public folder. And then home page dot html. So actually and then index dot html. So when the user goes to the default routes, they'll be greeted with the index dot html file that we just created. One more, one actually thing that we've got to use is if we currently do this at the moment, then the index.html won't have the styling applied to it. So to apply the styling, we need to actually specify that the public folder is our static folder. So we'll set app.use express.static and then inside will be the public. So now it knows that the public folder is a static folder. So what we'll do is we will say We'll go to package.json, we will change the main to server.js because we, that's what we called it, we didn't call it index. And then we'll also create a new script, we'll say run. And then nodemon. If you haven't installed nodemon, then I advise that you do and use the global modifier to install it for projects. And then we'll say nodemon server.js. Oh wait, we'll call it start actually, sorry. And now when we go to our terminal and then we say npm run start. It tries to, okay, so it's not working, the reason being is because we set create connection to MySQL but we haven't actually started the MySQL server, so we'll just go to XAMP. If you haven't installed XAMP, then I'll post the link in the description for you to install it. We start Apache server and we start MySQL. Both of these things need to be started in order for this to work, and then we'll restart our app. And now it's, as you can see, server starts on port 3000, and then we go to we don't need this anymore, we can just go to localhost 3000 forward slash and then it loads up there. And what we'll need to do now, because we started Apache and MySQL, we can say localhost um, php my admin, which comes pre-installed with XAMP. And we'll need to create the database. So what we'll do is we'll create a root on our application and it will say app.get slash create database and then we'll open it up as usual and then we'll create a variable which will hold our SQL query so we will call it simply SQL and it will be a string and it will say create database will be the SQL command and we'll call the database we'll say we'll call it just simply wikipedia Apple and then to actually send the query we'll say we need to do db.query SQL will be the first argument 
Second argument will be a callback function, which logs the error if there is one and the result if, we su if we've been successful in our query. If there's an error, then we need to throw the error. We can also log it if we don't want to stop the application. But else, then clearly we've been successful, so we'll log the result to our node mon terminal, and then we will say res.send database created, just so we've got a visual indicator that we've been successful. So now, check to see if our local server's running, it is. We'll go to that endpoint, slash create database, so we'll say slash create hyphen database. Okay, so it's saying cannot get, which is weird, so we'll just restart this, and then we refresh. Database created. So now, if we go to phpMyAdmin and refresh that as well, we should be able to see Wikipedia Apple has been created. But as you can see, there's no tables. So we'll need to solve that. So we will simply delete this route because we don't need it anymore. And also now that now that database is created, we can connect to it. So in the create connection object, we will say database and we will specify the database that we just created, Wikipedia Apple. And now we need to restart our local server to see if this doesn't cause an error. Okay, it's not causing an error, which is a good sign. So to create the table schema, we'll create a new root. We'll say app.get. We'll call it create hyphen table in kebab case again. What's been termed kebab case anyway. We will again create that SQL variable, which will hold our command. We use back six this time just so we can easily write out a string and multiple lines. The command will be create table. We will call it apple just for simplicity, or that's not used by apple. Open parentheses. The first column will be id. That will be type in, that will be type integer. The modifier will be auto increment. This is because it will be used as the serial and the primary key of the table. The other field will be title, which will be used to fetch, link up the row with the link that the user hovers over. Again, this will be made clearer later on. Its type will be variable character of 255 characters long, so a short string. The other, the other row will be content, which will be, again, varchar, but this one will be 300. 60 characters long 360 will limit the, the the content of the card container so no matter what we type into the content data cell it will always fit in the card container the next field will be image which will be varchar again 255 another image names are that long the next one will be bold which will again be varchar 255, this will contain the index of the words that need to be made bold. So this is how we get the text to be bold, even though it, the text rendered is from a SQL database. The final one will be type, which will simply be a float. And then finally, we need to set up the primary key. So we'll say, pri uh, we'll put this on new line actually. We'll say primary key in parentheses We'll specify the ID field to be the primary key. And then below that, we'll make the query. It's a db.query. SQL callback function, as we did before. If there is an error, then we'll throw that error. Self explanatory. And then we'll log the result. And then we will say res.send successfully created the table. So now we'll go to that route while we start a server though, because before it didn't work for some reason. So slash create type on table. So we'll just change this. Successfully created table, so we refresh this. And we click on Apple, the Apple table. And yep, the table has been created. It's got the fields that we specified. So this is good. The next step would be to insert data into the table. So we'll again delete this route because we don't need it anymore. We're never going to use it again. We'll create an another route. It will be insert data. Keep it simple. We'll open it up with the request and response objects. So what I'm going to do is now I'm going to show you how to insert multiple rows into a table in my SQL. 
So we'll create a variable, it'll be called post. This will be an array which holds each row that we want to insert into the table. So each iteration of the array will be an array in itself and each value in the array will match the table fields that we will specify in the query. So we'll say we'll create the query now. SQL, which is what we always call it. The command will be insert into. The table name's apple. And then in parentheses, we'll specify the fields that we want to insert data into. So we'll specify all of them other than ID. So title, content, image, bold, type. So title, content, image, bold, type. And so the first item in this array will be the title. So here what we want to do is we will create, it'll be fruit because it needs to, the title needs to match up with the text that the link is actually highlighting. So this one will be fruit, the next one will be trees, the next one will be cultivated, etc. You get the idea. So fruit, the content will be what we actually want to display. Remember, it needs to be variable character. The maximum is 360 characters long. So we'll copy this one for now. So in botany to after flowering. So we will copy the text that they want us to display. Paste it in here just to strip away all of its default styling that Wikipedia might have given the text. So we can easily paste it into VS Code. The next field is image. Well, what's our corresponding image? So it's in our public folder now. We'll just access, see what it looks like. It's strawberry underscore img. JPEG, it's important that we copy the file extension as well because sometimes they can have varying file extensions such as this one, this one is PNG, this one's not PNG, it's JPEG. So we'll copy that in there, there's a strawberry image. Next what we'll need to do is um, bold, so which word is bold? It is one, whoops, well it's not the first word, not the second. We'll cut, the words will be separated by space by the way, so Botany plus the comma will be counted as a single word. Two, three, no, it's four, it's word four, fruit. So we'll say four. And then type will be two. This won't be a string. Oh, and by the way, if multiple words are need to be bold, then we'll write them out like this. So it will be commas without spaces. It's very important that we do this, you'll see this later on. But in this instance, there's only one word, which is bold, and that's the fourth word. No others are bold. And what we'll do is we'll create another one, but I won't create it now. I just, I'm just i just showing you how to create one. I'll fast forward the creation of the other ones. And for the query, after we've done the apple, and then we've typed out the fields and the parentheses, we need to do values. And then for placeholder will be a question mark. So posts will be used as the replacement for question mark. The way that we do this is we say let query equals dv.query c equals the command and then post is the data that we want to insert instead of the placeholder. To specify that it's multiple values we use an array. So we wrap it in an array. This is very important and then we can do the callback like we always do. Like so. And then we can simply do if uh, throw uh, what we always do. I'm now going to fast forward the process of me filling out the rest of the rows. I won't do every single link contained in the first paragraph of the Apple Wikipedia page because that will simply be too long. I would just be the I would just be filling out the information that corresponds to these different pictures here. So I'll start that now. Okay, I've finished typing out all the values now. Um, I didn't fast forward because I realised that would be too long. I will explain that I've removed. Sometimes when you copy these values, you get these little reference uh, numbers. I've removed those when I copied them over. But other than that, as you can see, I've done everything that I need to for the the only card container which is type 3, which is the type without the image. All I've done for the image, I've just put null, which will basically, that will correspond in SQL to just undefined. So now we can access that root and make the query request. So, oh, actually, no, we missed out that insert data. So it's very important. 
So we can just say insert data. So yeah, that's a good sign. Let's fill out the data, refresh our table. And here we have it. They've been added, the values that we need. Here are the bold, as you can see, there's a lot of bold text for this one. Whoops, we don't modify that. And the types here as well. This is what we want. We can delete this route now, delete all of this because we won't need it again. We've already inserted the data. And so now we can go back to our index.html and we can begin creating the script, JavaScript file. And whilst we're at it, the last thing that we'll actually need to do in this local server is we'll create the post route that the user will send a request to from the application, the client side, when they hover over a link. And what we'll do is we will query the SQL database for the row which corresponds to the specific link that the user is hovering over. So for the comment, we'll say user wants data because they have hovered over a link. And then below that was the app.post slash get hyphen data. And then the callback we res re request response. And then we will say let title data equals what we're going to do is we're going to send over a JSON object and its field will be title data. So we'll access that. Again, this won't make much sense at the moment, but I just decided to create it. So we might have to go back and forth. We'll create the SQL request. It will, we'll say select all from Apple page, which is the name of the table, as you can see. Yeah, sorry, it's just Apple actually, I got mixed up. So it's just Apple, where title equals, and what we're gonna do here, we'll, we'll simply just use, oh, we'll place these back ticks actually. So we can just use string interpolation. So we'll say, we need to use single quotes for this to work, this query to work as well. And we'll open up our tag template literal, and then we'll say title data that variable that we literally just created. Close that off and then we'll make the query. Let query equals db.query. And then we'll add in that query and the callback function as follows. We'll do what we always do. Again, it's kind of getting monotonous, but oh well. And then we'll say console.log result. It's the last time that we're doing it anyway, so it's not really that much of a problem. And then what we'll do is we'll send back the result. So this will be handled by the client side. When you get to sending the post request using the fetch API. And whilst we're talking about that, we'll go back to our index.html and the scripts that we created earlier on, we'll actually start to create that now. So we don't really, oh yeah, sorry. We'll create it in the public folder because it's related to the index.html. And we'll say new file scripts.js. Actually, before we proceed with this, we need to finish off adding the link tags on this paragraph here. So the next one is on the cultivated, around the word cultivated, so we'll add it there. Again, it's very important that we don't leave a space after the text and the link tag, because you don't want to highlight the empty space there. The one after that will be genus, so we'll go to where it is, it's here. The next one is malice, which is a type of tree, I believe. So it's directly after genus, so we need to insert a space. We'll put that there, and then we'll copy this closing tag. We won't highlight the space, because that will just look off. And the final one, for us anyway, for the purpose of this tutorial, because we don't want to, it's not comprehensive, we're just giving you the tools that you need to know, is European colonist. And we included the space when we actually included that in the title. So as you can see, it's important that it needs to match, including spaces and capitals. Now we can go in our script file and do the coding there. So the first thing that we'll do in this JavaScript file, we'll add some spaces to make Ray for global variables. First thing that we'll do though, is we will put an event listener onto the window object, like so, and it will be mouse move so this event listener will be triggered every time the mouse moves anywhere on the window and then the callback function will have the argument of event what we'll do here is we will 
basically check to see if the user's cursor is past the halfway width of the window. So what we'll say is we'll put a comment so we know what we're doing because there will be a lot of code in this file actually. So we need to make it as clear as possible and readable. We'll say see if cursor is halfway past the middle of the screen or not. And below that we will create a variable called half window width. It will equal the window dot inner inner width divided by two. So this half window width will mark the halfway width point of the window regardless of how big the window is or not. Now below this we will create an if statement and we'll say event dot x. Event dot x will be the x coordinate of the mouse cursor. So for example if we just to show you, we'll say event dot x. Um, we'll also say event dot y, which is the y coordinate of the user's mouse. So if you go back to application now, you refresh, make sure our server's starting. It is, and we log this. Yeah, as you can see, we can see the x coordinates and the y coordinates, and it's updating in real time based on where our cursor is positioned in the inside the window. We're not going to do anything with that though, so we'll just delete it, just to give you a visual representation of what we're doing. We'll say if event.x is greater than half window width, so if they're past the halfway point of the window, then we will set the cursor halfway. Oh wait, actually we haven't created that boolean. So the first global boolean will be let cursor ha uh, past halfway. And that will be false to start off with. And we will set that to be true if we are actually past halfway, which will happen if the condition for the if statement is met. But else, then we'll set it back to false, like so. And we'll also create another global variable called let offset left, which will currently be instantiated to zero. We won't create the offset top variable which we will offset the card container by, so it's positioned correctly in relation to the text that the user is hovering over. The reason being is because the top offset or the vertical offset, that will be based off the position of the link element and not the mouse. So we don't need it and we'll write that out in a comment just so we remember. So we'll say we only record the X axis offset because the Y axis offset will be determined by the position of the link element and inside this if statement here we will say offset left equals event.x and then we will say minus 240. So what this will do is it will bring the card container towards the left which is currently what we want but if not if we are if we are not past the halfway point, then we want the majority of the card container to be on the right. So we will only offset the left. We will only subtract just um, 45. I worked these values out beforehand. These are the best values for the card width. You can fine tune them yourself if you're not happy with them. But it doesn't really matter as long as you know the basic principles of what we're doing here. Below, what we would do is we will give all of our link tags a event listener. So we'll write out a comment and we'll say, select all of the links and then we'll say document.query select to all. The query will be the text center class and then we'll put a space and an A. So this will be all of the A tags contained in the text center class. And then we'll say for each, so for each tags. Tags will now be each individual link tag element. We'll write out a comment, we'll say trigger event when cursor hovers over any link element, like so. So we'll say tags.add event listener and then mouse over. So when the user hovers over the element with the mouse, open that up, event will be the argument. And before we write any code in this, we're going to create some more global variables. We'll say let mouse over card 
container. The usage of these two buildings will become more clear later on. But for now, its value will relate to whether or not we're currently hovering over the card container and its respective link. That will be false by default because by default on the page load, no card containers will even be displayed, so it's impossible for us to be hovering over them. But obviously, when we are hovering over the link, which we will be in this event listener, we'll say mouse over link and we'll set that to be true which is its correct value. Below that, we need to, we'll create another comment, we'll say work out offset y value. This is where we work out the position of the card container vertically in relation to where the link tag is. So what we're going to do, actually, we're going to create above this event listener or the loop which creates the event listeners will create a new function but when well, the comment to identify the function will be so get the position of the link that is being hovered over we'll call the function get y coordinate of link again the name is important only the the method is Inside will create, it takes in the element itself, will pass in the event.target, which is the actual link tag, specific link tag element that the user hovered over to trigger the event listener. That will be assigned to L. So we'll create a new constant called rect. Rect will represent the bounding client rect of the element. All you need to know about get bounding client rect, all you need to know about this is that it essentially retrieves the positioning information of the element that it's being assigned to. And then in the function, we'll set the function to return. We'll say top just to make it clear that we're only getting the y coordinate. We'll say rec.top plus window.scroll y. And then we'll put semicolon here on the object that's being returned. So this will give us the correct position of the link element in relation to the window scroll. So what we need to do is we will need to, again, actually, we're going to create another global variable called store offset left and store offset top. We will create them below where we've done the offset left global variable. The comment will say capture position when hover over link. The reason being is because the X coordinate and the Y coordinate of the cursor changes all the time, but we want to capture that their values when the user triggers the event listener. Once they trigger the event listener, we don't want the values to change again until the card contain has been deinstantiated from the document. So we'll create a global variable called store offset left equals zero and this will store the offset for the left when the user triggers the event listener and then the other one will be store offset top which will relate to the y coordinate the y offset once we've done those we can go back to our event listener and we can say store offset top get y coordinate of link pass in event.target and then we'll return the top because remember that's the field that's the only field that we're turning on the object from there we'll say store offset top plus equals 18 again plus equals 18 you can tweak this if you want but i just found if you push it down by 18 more pixels then it looks good and then i'm going to say store offset left equals offset left we don't need to make any changes to offset left because it's already offset correctly in relation to whether or not the user's passed the halfway point or not. So we'll just create a snapshot of it when the event listener is triggered. So below this, what we're going to do is we're going to say let card container equals document.query selector. The reason why we're doing this is because we want certain behavior to be performed based on whether or not there's a card container that's already instantiated in the document. Because if they triggered this mouse over event listener and one's already created, then we need to 
the instantiate that card container and reinstantiate a new one. So to find because there's three different separate classes for the card containers, we need to write out a selector that's relevant to all three card container classes. So what we're doing the string is we will use square bracket and we'll say class. So we're targeting its class attribute and then we'll say start equals. So target anything that contains any of the word contained in these quotation marks and container. Now this will be relevant, the selector will target all three of the card container classes because they all contain the, the, word, the text card container. The only thing that distinguishes them from each other is the number afterwards but we're just completely ignoring the number in our selection, so this will target all three of them. Then we could put a semicolon to close this off. Now below this, we could say let new tag equals event.target.innerHTML, and then we can well use the trim method on this. New tag will be assigned, if we hover over fruit, then it will be assigned fruit. If we hover over trees, it will be assigned trees. So it, it gets the inner HTML value of the link tag that we hovered over. We use the trim method to remove any unnecessary white space because we don't want that because it will mess with our data retrieval from the SQL database. And then below this, we will create a new comment. This is basically just for debugging. What it will say is it will say, make sure there are no Boolean bugs. The purpose of this is basically just to ensure that there are no errors. So if card container is equal to null, so if there is no card container and the user is hovering over this link, then we want to say mouse over card container. We want to set back that to false. But later on down the line, mouse over card container will be set to true. And we just want to make sure that it's set to false. If there is no card container that's on the document because that's impossible. If there's no card container, then the user can't be hovering over it. So to make, every, to make sure that everything's streamlined and works properly, we need to set this if statement just to catch any errors that might occur because this is a, an error prone technique. There's a lot of things that can actually go wrong. It may, not, it may sound unrealistic, but it is actually true when you're doing something like this. What we need to do actually, we need to create yet another global variable and it will be called tag text. This is basically to compare the text of the this new tag, compare it to what it was previously, so we know whether we're not, whether or not we're hovering over a new link or not. Again, this will become more clearer when I actually get to doing the code. So I'll say in a comment, we'll say, so we know whether the user is hovering over a different link or the same link again. And then we'll just call it tag text it will equal an empty string. We've actually created all the global variables that you that we need. You'll be glad to hear that, I'm sure. So below this first if statement, we will create new lines and we will say, if they, if they want to view a card and none are, are currently rendered. So the condition for this will be if mouse over card container is null and card container actually we can move that so if mouse over card container is null and we know that no card container is rendered because of this if statement above then what we'll do we'll call get data whoops oh yeah because it's it's using autocomplete because we haven't actually created this method yet it makes sense but we're just going to write it out anyway Get data new tag again. Get data at the moment doesn't mean anything because we haven't created the function, but we will create it just in a second. The else if will be new tag not equal to tag text and card container is not equal to null. So if they're hovering over a new tag and there's already a card container that's been instantiated to the document because it's not equal to null. So if it's not equal to null, then it must be equal to a value. So we'll write out a comment saying what the condition is. If they have quickly switch to view another card before the animation has finished completing. And when the animation is complete, the card container will completely be removed from the document. 
but they can actually hover over another link if they're fast enough before the animation is completed. So if they do that, then this at this condition will be met. So what we'll do, we'll quickly remove the card container, which has been instantiated, and we know it has because of the condition. And then after that, we will call get data, and we'll pass in new tag. Now to make this comparison work, and so we can detect whether or not the hovering over a new link or not, we'll set tag text once after all these conditions are done, equal to new tag. So now this condition will work because tag text will always be one event listener behind the new tag. So they won't have the same values until the conditions are met. Now the get data method will be the very the, will be the bottom most method. It needs to be because it uses fetch API to make a request and it actually calls a function from that. It needs to be at the bottom because it needs to be the last thing assigned in order for the function call in the then method to work. So what we'll say is we'll say get data for corresponding link being hovered over is what the comment will be. Below the comment we'll say function get data as we call it. Its argument will be tag text, which is the tag text that we passed in. We'll say the new tag. Fetch will be the endpoint that we created earlier on in the server, which was get hyphen data, so we'll write that out as so. The object method will be post because it is a post route after all. Headers will be content type and content type will be JSON data. This is why it required JSON, the JSON method on Express because we need our local server to handle JSON data. The body field will send over JSON data which is why we use the json.stringify method. The field name will be title data as we specified in our actual local server as you can see title data and its value will be tag text. So well now when we get a response from our server, so when the result is sent back, this then method, this then callback will be called and it will have the argument we will store response in res and we will pass the JSON object. So now it will be equivalent to normal JavaScript data type. So when it's finished passing, we'll call another then method and in that we'll have data as the argument as the passed JavaScript array and it is array. To get up to get access to the object from the array, we'll say let return data equals data and it's an array of one object with one item inside of it. So we'll get access to it using the zero index. And if return data actually contains data, then we'll only call this render data method which we need to create if it does actually contain a value. Render data hasn't been created, so we're actually going to create it now. So we will say render data in the form of a card container, because the data that we've currently got back is a JavaScript object and the fields will be title, content, image, bold, etc. and also ID as well, we, we won't be using that. Now we want to render that data, we want to essentially transpile it into HTML element. So this is what the, this is what the render data function will be doing. It will take an argument because it needs to, because we passed it in there, open it up. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to create a JavaScript element and we'll assign it to a card container variable. So we'll say card container equals document dot create element and we will create a div element. Below that we will say let render consent equals gener eight content render data dot content render data dot bold. So this generate content function is going to take in the content, which is the paragraph text of the card container and the bold. Remember bold is a string uh, containing the indexes of the words that we need to make bold. And what this method is going to do is it's going to make the words that need to be made bold into bold and it's also going to 
give the fade out effect onto the last word. If the content of the render data is long enough, so we need to actually create this function before you can proceed with the, proceed with the render data function because we're definitely not done with it yet. So we'll create a new comment. We'll say generate the text to be displayed in the card because that's what this function will be doing. We'll say function generate content. Now it has two arguments. We'll call the first one content. The second one will be match. Inside we'll say let content array equals content dot split and then inside will be a string with space so content array will be an array and it will contain each item in the array will be each individual word of the render data dot content paragraph and we'll also say let match array equals match dot split and we'll split it on the comma so now match array will be set will also be separated into an array and each item in the array will be the individual numbers below this we'll create a comment we'll say get the number of characters in content and we'll say let length of content equal content dot split and we'll split that it will be a string with no spaces in the middle so length of content will now be an array and that will be every single character from content and we need to get the number of characters so we'll use the length. So now length of content will be how many individual characters, not word, but in, not words but individual characters in the content paragraph. Below this we will create a new comment, we'll say store word to be displayed. And we will create a variable called new content. This will be an array and it will hold all of the words which need to be displayed. This array will actually be returned at the end of this function and it will we will use the join method to turn all of the iterations into a single string. Also create another array and the comment above it will be index of words to be bold. This we'll call it let bold store an empty array like that you'll see what this is used for in a second if it, if it isn't already clear so we'll create a loop the iteration will be called i whoops and then we'll say the loop will run for the length of the content array which remember is each word of the paragraph and then we'll increment it Inside the loop, we will say index of word that needs to be bold, and we'll say let bold word equals number. So we'll cast the value of match array. I will cast it to be a number. So instead of it being a string, it will now be a number. And we'll say bold store dot push bold word minus one minus one because the in the loop obviously starts at zero but we started counting the words at one so to make them match up with each other we need to simply minus one from the bold word which is now a number thanks to us casting the number data type around the match array and we push it to an empty array which will hold all of the numbers contained in the match array it does this for a loop. We will also say let word equals content array. I so now in this loop word each iteration of this loop word will be assigned to each word of the paragraph in order. So I went to the the first loop word will be I and then the second time the second iteration will be went and then the third time it will be two. And then, so below this we'll create a comment. We'll say detect if word should be bold. And we'll say if bold store dot include I. So if I is contained in the bold store array, that means that the word of this iteration needs to be bold because we specified as such in the data stored in our PHP database that this specific word should be bold. So what for word, we'll say word equals 
span and we'll close it off like so. Span. We're using back ticks by the way, so we can use string interpolation. And the content of the span will be the word, the original word, and it will be styled to be bold. So we'll just say font weight colon space bold space isn't necessary but it's just there for neatness and now words should be bold because of this span but only if the iteration is contained in the bold store array we'll also need to create another if statement we'll say if the number of characters is above 300 then make the last word fade out it's not 300 actually it's 230 which is a number which i calculated it's roughly the length the number of characters that need to be stored in the content field of the of the row in order for us to make the last word fade out. Because remember, if the paragraph is only short, then we don't use the fade out effect. Wikipedia doesn't either. So we say length of content, the number of characters is stored in that array. If it's above 230, it's if there's more than 230 characters stored in the paragraph. And i equals to content array dot length minus one so if this is the last iteration basically then word equals to again we'll use the span and back ticks inside will be the word the previous value of word and then class will give it the fade out fade text class which we created earlier on now this is good finally what we need to do is we'll need to push the word to the new content array. So where by the time the loop is finished, new content will contain all of the individual words of the paragraph. And once the loop is completed, we'll say return new content. And like I said earlier, we will convert it back from an array into one single string. And we will join it on the spaces like so. Now we can go back to our render data function and we can say, if render data dot type so if it's the first card container type then we need to render out the first card container type so we'll say card container dot set attribute we'll set its class and we will say card container one and then we will say card container dot inner html to create the actual content it needs to be displayed inside of the card container and we use back tick so we can write out text on it on multiple lines easily and for in a html we'll simply won't come at this for a second we'll copy the all of the div content inside the card container so we'll cut it just to, just to make it clear what i've copied we can delete that now we don't need it i'll we'll go back to our scripts so we'll paste it in here the things that will change are we will change we will remove this we want to read the quotation marks after the images folder because every all the images that we need are contained inside the images folder but we'll say render data dot image and for the alt we will say render data dot title and for the paragraph we'll move all of this because we don't need it for the paragraph it will be simply render content this should be all the the content that we need to display now the string that we need to display inside the paragraph now this is good inside this if statement though we're going to write a comment so modifications if cursor is past halfway point so if the cursor is past the halfway point currently the arrow of the first card container type is on the left we want to omit we want to move the arrow to the right of the card container so if cursor past halfway, remember that boolean that detects whether or not the cursor is past halfway point or not. We'll say we'll change the card container. We'll say style dot clip path. We'll change the clip path property to a polygon method, which is what it was originally anyway. But we'll change some of its values. The first, the top left point will be minus ten percent, three percent. So what it was previously. But then the, the changed will be 70%, 3%, so it'll be a straight line for 70% of the width of the top points. And then 
the arrow tip will be 75% vertical space and then it will go to the very top, so zero. And then the right edge of the arrow will be 80%, 3%, and then we'll go to 110%. Again, if you don't remember why we're going to 110%, then it's because of the box shadow. 3%, so it's a straight line. And then finally, we'll create the bottom right point. That'll be 110%, 110%. And then the bottom left edge will be a minus 10%, 110%, as so. Now, in this parent if statement, we'll say else if. So if the render data.type is equal to 2, then we will just copy this for brevity because I know this video is long, but again, it's not an easy task really. It looks a lot simpler than it actually is. So we'll say card container dot inner html we did what we did before and we'll just copy this out just for ease it could actually be the same values because the only thing that changes is the second type card container of the class and we'll also say if cursor is past halfway point then what we're actually going to do is we will say store offset left and we will subtract its value by 160 the reason why we're doing this is because the second type of card container is actually a different width to the first type and third types. So what we need to do, to make it look nice, we need to subtract 160 if we are past the halfway point. That way, most of the width of the second type can be displayed on the left. Because currently offset simply isn't enough. Our store offset left is simply not enough for this quite this wide type of card container. So that's why we add in some more offset if we are past the halfway point else the offset is good enough so we'll put a comment saying what we're doing we'll say solve error of it not being horizontally aligned properly again you can speak these values that are not up to your standards but it should be fine trust me else if the third type is type 3 so we'll say create a condition if it is the third type render day is type 3 we will say again set its attribute but instead the third type this time and the inner html will be very simple it will just be card container that inner html equals backticks and then we will simply always say is p because that's what it needs to be posing p tag and then the tag template will simply be render content and now outside of all these this huge if block we will say we'll say move element move element into correct position so we need to change the card containers top and left value because remember it's at its absolute position to the offset top and offset left this will instantiate well we when we do instantiate it it will make it so it will be in the correct position based off of which element we're hovering over. So we'll say card container dot style dot top equals store store offset top plus pixels because it needs to be pixels in order for it to work properly. And then we'll do it for the left as well. E equals store offset left plus pixels and we we'll need to add event listeners so the reason for this is because we need to detect whether or not we are currently hovering over the card container or currently hovering off when we're hovering over the card container we don't want the card container to disappear but when we hover off we want it to disappear then unless we're currently hovering over its link its related link so we'll say card container dot set attribute and we'll give it an on mouse leave attribute we use on mouse leave because that includes the elements children in its detection so we'll say mouse out of spelling of this is important mouse out of con container this so we could pass in the card container element into the function which we haven't created yet and we'll cut to copy this because I know this video is long. 
do the event listener for this will be on mouse over and the function that we call will be mouse in container and it will still have this as the argument and now finally we'll say document dot query selector we'll select the body tag and then we will pre-pen the card container so finally this will instantiate the card container as the first child of the body the first child because we want the card container to display above everything else so now the final thing that we need to do is actually create these two functions so above where we've done all this but below where we added the event listeners to all of our link elements we'll say we'll create a new comment and we'll say hovered out of mouse container function mouse out of container vs code helpfully auto completes it first we'll take the card container which is this and what we'll do is we will say set timeout we use a set timeout function the reason why we use a set timeout function is because we want to give some leeway we don't want the card container to disappear straight away if the user hovers out of it because they might be hovering back to the link so we want to give them a small opportunity for them to hover between the link and the card container and the card container to not disappear we'll change it to 50 milliseconds actually sorry because we don't want to give them that long because there's no need so we'll just say 15 milliseconds delay to allow user to transition between card and link inside the set timeout we'll say mouse over card container equals false because they're no longer hovering outside of the card container and then we'll say if mouse over link so if they're currently not hovering over the link after after five seconds of leeway then we'll have to remove it so what we'll do is first we'll play the animation the close animation so it's a plays close animation then delete that's what we'll do card container dot style dot animation we will give the card container out to card container out animation to the card container so card container out and that will last for 0.3 seconds same as the in animation and we'll set it to be forward so it will stay invisible and then we'll say set timeout of 300 seconds, 300 milliseconds, sorry, because that's how long the animation lasts for. So once the animation is completed, we'll set this card container, we'll remove it completely. As for the mouse in container function, it'll be a lot simpler. It will take in card container, because remember it had the same this keyword passed into it. And all it would do is say mouse over card container. We need to set this to true now, because the user is currently hovering over the mouse card container. The final thing that we need to do is to create the mouse out event listener onto all of the tag elements. So below where we did the mouse over event listener, we will say tags dot add event listener mouse out. We don't need to use mouse leave on this because it doesn't have any children in the link. And we'll say mouse over oh, whoops mouse over link, and we could set this to false now. Obviously, we just hovered out of it. That's when this event listener will be triggered. And we'll say let card container. We'll just copy this actually. Again, because this video is already too long, so we don't want to make it any more longer than it needs to be. And again, we'll do the same thing. We'll copy this. Again, we'll just copy because it's so long now. I'm kind of running out, I'm kind of running out of steam, frankly. And what we'll do... Okay, that needs to be incremented properly. And what we'll do is we'll say, we'll delete this and we'll say if, if mouse over card container is false and card container is not equal to null. So if there is an existing card container and they're currently not hovering over it, then we need to remove that. We need to remove it because they've hovered out of the link. They're not hovering over the card container. If they were hovering over the card container, then obviously we don't want to remove the card container. 
But since they left the link and they're not in the card container and there is a card container, then we need to set the animation to to out to play the out animation. And then once it's done, we need to remove that. And then we need to remove it. And the final thing that we do was to say mouse over card container, set that to be false. And then yeah, so and then that's actually all we need to do. Once it's removed, that's completed. As you can see, it's all working, as I'm sure you already, you're already testing anyway. It's all working as how we want it to be. This image is directly below where our cursor was. For example, that, look at the arrow here. It's towards the right of trees, but if we hover over here, now the arrow is towards... Sorry, it was towards the left, now it's towards the right. It's this. See, the image here should be on the right, the text should be on the left. It's right on this one, but when, it's, when we pass the halfway mark and we hover over card container type 2 it should be the other way around so what we actually forgot what I got confused in is um this here and what I needed to do we'll just we'll just cut this for now cut not delete we'll say yes yeah, so if cursor is past halfway then we will copy this we'll change this to if it's not halfway this is the correct code with the which way around is it again yeah the image on the left the text on the right yeah, sorry, this should be here. This should be in the else. Because else that it will be past halfway point, and then it will have the extra offset. And we'll copy this. Paste it in like that. And we'll change the positioning of these divs. So we'll cut that. And we will new line. We'll paste it in like that. And we'll change the positioning around. So this div comes first, the text, and then the image comes later. So now when we refresh, we click on hover over this side. Now the image is on the right, as it should be. Text is on the left. But the card container type 2, when we are on the other side, so we're not past the halfway mark, when we hover over that, now the image is on the other way around, so left. And also, obviously, it's offset correctly, so the majority is to the right. And then the majority of this is towards the left. Everything's working fine. This is all good. Uh, and as you can see, this as well, and the fade out as well. The fade out here, as you can see, I put a lot of effort into this tutorial. It seems simple, but it's actually extremely complicated. Because as you can see, all this code just for something which the audience they won't know that this is that there's this much code involved. But there is. It's quite a lot considering it's such a simple function at the end of the day. But I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I'm sorry it was long. I hope you benefited from it. And if you did, then please like and subscribe. You'll be doing me a huge favour if you did. And don't hesitate to post any comments. If you do have any comments, then I'll be very happy to answer any queries that you have. And peace out, guys. See you in the next one.